Well, good evening. Welcome to our service this evening. Welcome back. If you were here this morning, I'd like to invite you to just stand with us. And we're, we're going to sing uh, three Christmas hymns together just to kind of uh, continue our thinking of our Advent and uh, celebrating the anticipation of the, the birth of our Savior.
welcome to Westside. So glad to see everyone back this evening. Uh, take a minute and just greet the people around you. Good evening. Welcome this evening. We're so glad that you are here to worship and celebrate with us this evening. Just a few announcements that I'd like to share with you. Most of you have probably already recognized that in the worship folder, we now have this tear-off section that is very important. It helps you to communicate with us. If you have been a regular attender here and you have changed your address or the information has changed, you can notify us on one side of this. If you are new to us, we want to get that information for the first time. So please fill this out. There's also an area here where you can list any prayer requests that you might have and you can deposit these on the half round kiosk that's out in the foyer. Also, we want to point out that on that half round kiosk that's out there are these devotional books that go along with what we are doing here in the church during the season of Advent. There are just a few of these that are left, so if you have not yet picked one of these up, one per family, if you have not yet picked one of these up, there are a few that are still in that area, so you'll want to pick that up. In the area just between the two doors in the foyer by the lamp, there is an area and you will be able to find a sheet that will give you a six month overview of what has been happening here at the church. You're going to want to get a copy of that. That is very, very important that you see that. There's lots of things that take place that as you're coming and going, you may not be aware of. You may want to uh, take that and read that carefully so that you know everything that's taking place. We encourage that. Let's see. Oh, yes. Also on the half-round kiosk that's out in the foyer, there is a, an area that is going to help you with your Christmas budget. If you uh, are sending out Christmas cards, who needs to pay postage when you can place those Christmas cards in the post office box that's out there alphabetically so that the individuals within the congregation that you are sending cards to can go there, look in that box, and pull out their Christmas cards without having you pay any postage. And you can do other things with that money. Don't you think that'd be a good idea? That's available for you also out in the foyer. Again, welcome this evening. We're so glad that you are here. Ushers, if you would come forward, please, for the celebration of our tithes and offerings. Master, we rejoice in your presence, and we are grateful that we have an opportunity to come and worship and celebrate you in many ways. We recognize, Lord, that one of the ways that we worship you and celebrate you is through the giving of tithes and offerings. We are grateful for all that you do for us and the blessings that we receive from your hand. Please accept our tithes and offerings in the manner in which they are given freely from our heart that you may use them as you direct in Jesus name. Amen.
The perfect child gently awakes a mother best his God's face. Close my eyes to see the night when love was born. And Hi, my name is Chase Holbrook. I am a sophomore ministry major and a theater minor at Mid-America Nazarene University. Um, I'm originally from Des Moines, Iowa. Go Hawks! Um, and I've been going here to Westside since this last summer. And I've just been having an awesome time here experiencing worship with you guys on Sunday morning and then all the fun activities that come. A uh, holiday tradition uh, that I remember in my mind is right after Thanksgiving on Black Friday, uh, roughly in the evening, me and my half-siblings and my mom would get together and we'd put up the Christmas tree and all the decorations uh, throughout the house. And to me, that was always a memory of uh, times of changing. We'd come from being thankful to this time of remembering that our Savior was born. Uh, one fond memory of that is I always got the privilege to put up the star, being the youngest out of the children. And I would always have trouble with it. And my half-siblings would pick on me about being the shortest. And so I always had to stand on a chair uh, to place the star on top of the tree. But I can now say that I'm tall enough to put the star on the tree. Hope means to me, um, during Christmas time, that our Savior came to us. That He loved us enough to leave the throne and come to us. And ultimately, later on um, in the story of what our Savior did for us, He would buy us back and redeem us. Um, we come from Thanksgiving in a time of remembering being thankful. And, and we should always be thankful. But then, as we come into a season of hope, of what Jesus did and remembering that, wow, I'm thankful for all this stuff because it's possible through the hope of Christ coming to us and ultimately dying for us on the cross. A Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I'm gonna be reading from 
Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etruria, and Trachontinus, and Linus, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Ananias and Capaeus, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all of the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. Lord Jesus, thank you for this word and the prophet, John, as he spoke, as he recalled what Isaiah said. We're grateful today, Lord Jesus, that you broke into the world to bring salvation. We pray that the light of your presence would be so bright tonight that we could not help but to see the love of God that Isaiah just sang about. How grateful we are tonight, Jesus, to worship you and to trust you this evening for your glory to rain down upon us. In Jesus' name.
By mercy, me and everything they do is inspired. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful words to that song. We open the altar this evening for any and all that might like to come and just bow before the Lord. If you'd like to do that, would you just make your way forward? Pastor Joe is going to lead us in our prayer time this evening. Master, our hearts are filled with joy as we stand in your presence today. As we look around us, we see so much evidence of your presence. We sense your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us and the manner in which you choose to direct us we thank you for your written word. We thank you, Lord, for your heartfelt, audible voice. We thank you that we can lean upon you when we are going through difficulties and struggles. It is you who brings hope to us. Thank you, Lord Master. Pray especially for those who are kneeling at this altar of prayer. Lord, whatever it is that they are lifting up, I confess before you, Lord, that I do not know all of the things that they are raising before you, but you do. And we know that you care about those. And I pray, Father, for your blessing upon them. That you would not only hear, but that you would respond to the prayers that are being lifted up before you. I pray for those that were, are within the congregation that have been going through difficulties and struggles, both physical, emotional, financial, whatever the need, Lord, I pray that you would draw close to them during this Christmas season. For those that may be looking for employment, Lord, I pray that you would help them, that they might find that employment. For those that feel alone, I pray that they would sense the companion that comes alongside. I pray, Father, that you would prepare us all, heart and soul, that we might be able to receive the word of truth, the message that you have been speaking to Pastor Dave about and he will shortly be bringing to us. I pray for Pastor Dave as he brings that message before us that it might be your word. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this evening and speak clearly to us. Help us that we may not only listen, but that we may hear it as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My heart is so flooded today with, uh, with the goodness of God. 
And I've seen so much this day um, to just thank him for how he's working. And uh, thinking about Joe as he was praying that the Spirit would fall upon us tonight, and he already has fallen upon us this evening. And he's been speaking to us all day long. If we have been listening, um, I, I just am... My mind is just awash with thanksgiving to God as I listen to um, Haley Stapleton play the piano on a level I'd never heard her play before. I just shook my head and marveled at how good God is. As I watched um, our children and teens um, bring to life this unbelievably strong message this morning, the imagery that stuck in my mind was so poignant as all of these people are sitting at the feet of Jesus and then he poses in the form of the cross and everyone falls on their faces and, and then as he redeemed us I couldn't get away from how powerful it was to see one by one the stain removed from the heart as they came and bowed before Jesus. And I noticed that some of the kids were more apt to hug Jesus than others were. Some had to give him the fist bump or some of them just wanted to get away from him as fast as they could. <laughs> but some of them, I thought, as, he, as they bowed before him and he took the stained cloth off and put it on the floor or on his lap, they embraced Jesus. And I thought, that's what we've done when he took the stain away from us. He drew us into an embrace and redeemed us. And then I, I thought, as Isaiah was singing that song this evening, Isaiah, where are you? Beautiful song. Never heard that song. It's beautiful. My challenge to you, young man, is that you just keep working and preparing your voice because you have a gift, and I expect you to use it. And if you don't, I will talk with you. <laughs> <clears throat> Powerful message. And then the last song we sang, um, such a tiny offering compared to Calvary. None of this has anything to do with my message, okay? It's just all stuff I'm trying to get off of me so I can preach. <laughs> Such a tiny offering. I, I couldn't help but think as that song was being sung in the, in the play this morning and how the little children came up with their offering in their hand and they raised it before the king and then they laid it at his feet. That's exactly what Jesus wants is what we have. And just, wow, what a day. What a day. I'm sorry I feel compelled to preach, but what a day. The hope of God just opened up before us all day long. The message this evening is the way of hope. The way of hope. I thank you, Chase, for working with us today. And <laughs> Wouldn't you know I'd give you all those long hairy names? And I, I'm sitting there thinking, glad it's him and not me. <laughs> Sometimes I get to those long lists of names that are kind of difficult, some of them, and I just go in a whole bunch of people. <laughs> and if you really want to know their names, talk to somebody that can pronounce them, because I can't. Um, but um, the way of hope from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I want to draw your attention to him quoting Isaiah. The voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, and the rough ways shall become smooth, and all the people will see God's salvation. The prophet proclaimed, Isaiah proclaimed, and then brought to light by John the Baptist at the edge of the Jordan River as he proclaimed the way of hope. 
wonder this evening any, if any of you have ever driven down a rocky one lane or one lane mountain road. Or it, they said it was kind of two ways, but you knew that it really was only one way. And uh, as, you, as you are driving on that uh, curvy, whether you're going up or whether you're going down, you realize that you're, ele- you're at an elevation that could be dangerous because let's just say as you're going up to your right, you notice that there is quite a drop off there and then to your left is a rock ledge. <laughs> and you're going, this is not good. Um, You hope that no one comes, but if a car comes around the bend at the last second, one of you must creatively and meticulously pull halfway over onto the tiny shoulder. If you don't see each other in time, disaster could strike. This kind of road is especially fear-inducing for people who are only familiar with straight paths. Wide roads. (laughs) But if you grew up in an area of a country that is flat or in a well-lit city, imagine the fear that a dark, winding path could elicit within you as you longed for straight ways (laughs) again. In context of this scripture, there weren't any cars driving up the winding mountain roads, but not being able to see could still put a person in harm's way. Uh, Thieves are wild... Wildlife could be just around the bend with the potential to cause you physical harm or to leave you stranded without resources. Mountains make walking more difficult. And if you've ever climbed a mountain or gone hiking in the hills, you realize that the change in elevation can make one's journey kind of tough, not to mention the difficulty of keeping your footing on a rough, rocky incline. The danger and the difficulty of craggy, curvy mountain paths are sometime are are something the listeners to the words of Isaiah would have related to, but this text isn't talking about literal mountains and valleys. It's talking about preparing the way for the Lord so that people might see and hear and know the way of hope that the Lord provides. So I want to bring a few points to you this evening. The first is that prophets speak truth to power. Prophets speak truth to power. And John is a prophet. Luke starts out this chapter with with listing the rulers of the day. As Chase read them, he lists both the political leaders of Rome, the ruling empire, and the religious leaders of the Jewish people. And the list that he reads alludes to the first alludes first to the original context of Isaiah's passage being quoted, which was spoken to people in exile. And it was spoken that they might have hope that the Messiah would one day come to free them, that they would know that though they were in a different land, God still heard their cries for deliverance. Isaiah proclaims that God hears your cry. He knows your dilemma. He knows your paths are not straight. He has the ability to come and make the crooked way straight for you. And though the New Testament Jews are not in exile, they are still a very much oppressed people. They are still in a wilderness place, crying out for God to save them from their oppressors. They are in need of salvation. So they are waiting with great expectation of a Messiah that would come and deliver them from oppression. However, salvation for the Jews is deliverance from their oppression. Jesus provided a different way of hope. Enter John the Baptist, the one who prepares the way for the coming of the Lord. John is speaking a a truth that counters the systems of the day. It's a countercultural message that John is speaking. And quite frankly, John, the way that he is proclaiming the good news of the one who can give us salvation and make our, our life straight and 
and cared for and needs met. He, he, he's making Gentiles mad and he's making Jews mad as he proclaims. He is declaring, first of all, that he is declaring that Caesar is not Lord. Hmm. This is significant during Roman rule when people are commanded to declare Caesar not only as ruler of Rome, but also as a god. This is not so unusual. Look at the time of captivity in the Old Testament when Nebuchadnezzar wanted everyone to bow at his image and, and proclaim that he was God. And we see again and again in Scripture people elevating themselves to a position of God because they are a ruler of an empire or because they are the head of an empire and they are trying to equate themselves with God. And when John declares that Caesar is not Lord, he is angering or has the potential to anger the Gentile world who wants to say, well, who does he think he is? Saying that our Caesar is not God. Is he not a Jew? Let's just silence him. John is not speaking of following religious law, and making sacrifices and following rules the way they have done so in the past. John is declaring that baptism and repentance are reordering of what they have known. This is a completely different form from the current systems of the church. It is a radical and countercultural call that urges people to think differently. Can I tell you something tonight? The Holy Spirit of God, when He speaks to us, He's going to urge us to think differently. He's going to urge us to think counterculturally. He's going to think us to, to think differently than just religious practices. He certainly does not want us complying with the laws that are bereft and morally bereft, I should say. The laws that are, are against what we know to be the case of the Word of God. He, he certainly doesn't want us to kowtow to that. But neither does He want us to have a form of religion that is devoid of the power of the Spirit of God. He wants us. To think and behave counterculturally, because he is not at all concerned with this culture that needs to be countered by his authenticity. Authenticity, <laughs> or authenticity. What was? I'm I'm just about out of words tonight. Chase, would you come and finish for me? <laughs> We're done with the big words. The call is to live counterculturally, and that hasn't changed from the day of John the Baptist to this very day. Our challenge is to make our path straight toward the Lord. As we journey through Advent, we also need to make straight paths for the way of the Lord. We can list easily the rulers of our day, both political and religious, who often, I'm just going to say it, who often take up too much space in our lives. One month ago, we concluded midterm elections. Is anybody here at all glad that the elections are over? Do you know that in the next four to six weeks, the push toward 2020 will begin? So, yeah, exactly how I feel too. Just it's exhausting to think of this. Half, I know that half of the American population is happy and half is not. One thing I know for certain, the king we live for and serve is not of this world. We live for the kingdom of God. It's easy to place our hope in political systems or politicians. And while they can do good, we can hope and work for good. It's important to recognize that our hope is not in them. 
The hope that we have for Western civilization is not in a legislative ability of a government to say something. The hope of Western civilization is that we, the body of Christ, will again fall before our Father God and allow Him to work in us the way that He wants to work and allow us to speak for Him in the way that He wants us to speak. And He wants to make straight our path so that we can be markers kind of like signs on a curvy road saying, watch out up ahead. (laughs) Are any of you thankful for that? Just once in a while, uh, a sign that tells you something's right in front of you. (sighs) Another corrective adjustment in the path we follow is that we we aren't called to a religious legalism. Legalism can often become easy and more attractive than repentance and grace, but we are called to the messy work of love and grace. Setting up more rules for ourselves and others to follow in order to please God misses the intent of Scripture from my perspective. Instead of drawing us closer into relationship with Jesus, I have found that the practice of religion can induce shame at our inability to achieve impossible standards. Is there anyone here tonight that is just a tiny bit frustrated that you cannot completely obey the letter of the law? If you can, you are, might I say, sadly mistaken. Because you can't. You and I are incapable of living out perfectly the letter of the law. That's why we are saved by grace, not by works, not by adherence to a system. I I know some very well-meaning people that try to legislate morality, and you can't do it. While the Jews were looking for rebuilding of the temple to be their hope, we often look for the best church with the perfect pastor or just the right music, missing that maybe there is more to being in a relationship with God than just that. Um, How many of you think you found the perfect church here? Well, that was a trick question. I'm so sorry. It was so wrong of me. There is no perfect church. We can get so caught up sometimes on looking for that, I don't know the word, utopian kind of existence, that we can just find ourselves never fulfilled in a body of Christ somewhere. I really would like for us to learn to appreciate each other's weaknesses as well as our strengths. Because when we do, we have the capability of coming alongside someone and recognizing that maybe we can provide something that they need and vice versa. The work of Christ is pouring out of oneself and loving other people. Turning away from the way things have always been done and looking at the world with a new lens of love and grace and hope. A countercultural kind of thing whereby we are not afraid to try something new. And in fact, I'll go so far as to say that... We should be failing some on things that we try because it shows that we're not afraid to try something new, a new methodology, a a new idea. We're we're not afraid of risking something. I don't want to play it. Please hear me. I don't want to play it safe when it comes to following Jesus. 
I, I don't want to be so out there that I'm, just, that I'm just not conscientious or reasoned or thought out, but I'm talking about not being afraid to say, you know what, I know we've never done that before, but I feel with my whole heart that we're supposed to be doing that. Let's give it a shot. And then just be surprised possibly by what God had in mind for us. John's call to the people that day and for those weeks that he preached preparing the way for Jesus, John's call was repentance. We too are called to repentance and to think differently about our relationship with Jesus. I uh, can only speak for myself, but there's still great work that needs to be done in me. And if I somehow stand against the conviction of the Spirit of God and refuse to repent, I'm on a very dangerous road. And a cliff is just to my right. <laughs> I drop off. <laughs> and there's something coming my way and I don't know what I'm going to do. Repentance is the thing that brings health to a person's soul. This is not a small task. Reorienting our life is difficult. It, it could mean a new schedule throughout the week in order that the space is made for me to listen to Christ. It might mean a reordering of my mindset. Finding the things that are keeping me from seeking God or seeing God at, at work in my life or keeping me too busy to hear from God and, and somehow changing that is a reordering of our heart. Finding those things, even good things, that have taken the place of worship in my heart and removing them so that again I might worship God. Not just fulfill a position in the clergy. Can I tell you one of the pro most predominant ministerial liabilities? Just so you can get a glimpse into us, folks who call ourselves preachers. At least for me, is not making a sermon out of every text I read in the scripture. but to actually let the scripture speak to me as a child of God and not worry about the sermon. You know, when I first started preaching, I didn't think I would ever, ever, ever be able to come up with illustrations to prove the point of scripture. And I used to live in mortal fear, like, how am I going to be able to come up with those illustrations? You know, the things that really people remember. You know, how am I going to do... And then as I realized that Jesus was faithful, in fact, he would flood my mind with illustrations. Everything becomes an illustration now, which is why I preach for 40 minutes. <laughs> Life is an illustration of the glory of God and the hope that he brings into our life when we allow him the privilege of making our ways straight, correcting the crooked places in our lives. We must also prepare our hearts for the coming of the Messiah. But we also look for Christ to be present here with us. And we are hopeful for his return. We will miss where Jesus is already at working if we aren't open to the work God wants us to do right here and right now in our world. So the conclusion to this message this evening is this. Advent 
of all times might be one when the road curves a bit more than normal. The lure of commercialism and the idolatry of prioritizing even good things like family over Jesus are very present. The way gets windy and curvy and a little difficult to see Jesus in light of it all. Others struggle year round to see any kind of hope. All they see are the mountains that are in the way. But Christ came to show us a new way. A way of hope, of healing, of holiness. He revealed a kingdom that is different from that of this world. And we can repent and live in that kingdom here and now. We don't have to wait for the kingdom of God in the future. He desires that we live in his kingdom today. And that, my friends, will take some reordering in our lives. Christ came to show a new way, the way of hope. And kind of, if you'll allow this connection, the way of hope is the way of holiness. As we seek a new way of doing things, the landscape begins to change. The rough places are made smooth. The mountains are laid low. God works out in our heart a way of holiness. And this way of holiness is hope for all people. The text says God's salvation is for all people. We help to bring wholeness and hope to those around us when we make straight the path for the Lord to work in us. And often circumstances, whether from life or from our choices, make it difficult for us or others to see Jesus. We need the voices of others, like John. Or somebody that's really close to you who has a very good discerning spirit. To declare the way. That we might see Jesus clearer than before. We often need to be that voice for others so they can see the salvation of Jesus. You and I are not John the Baptist. Because we are Nazarenes. I'm so sorry. We are not John the Baptist. But certainly the Lord could use our voice. To help prepare the way. For people to come and meet Jesus as their Savior. The way of hope. Next week we'll be looking at hope again. I hope you'll come. Don't make me come out there. I will. Let's pray, shall we? Would you stand with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for enlightening our hearts tonight from a very familiar passage in a very familiar person, John the Baptist. Thank you, Lord, for bringing him into the world to prepare people to meet you, Jesus. And we would be so honored, Father, if you would use us in some way to help prepare the way for people to meet Jesus too. And oh, Father, how they could, maybe for the first time in their life, they could see hopelessness dissipate and despair replaced with hope. And they could realize, Jesus, that you love them. So, Lord, please take the content of this little message tonight, Jesus, and drive it into our hearts that we might be different. And uh, do things the way you want us to do it, not the way culture or religious practices do it. 
your way, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you remain standing as Pastor Joe pronounces benediction this evening? May God straighten your path, and may you prepare the way for the Lord within your heart, and may you seek his path every day of your life. You are dismissed.